Okay, so welcome back to um, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, um, as a handbook for civil disobedience. So um, the recording of last week's is available on, on Christian Climate Action website. Uh, just a really brief recap. So last week we saw that Jesus was living in an unjust society with rigged courts. We saw that John the Baptist hardly got a fair trial. Um, a massive disparity between rich and poor, racism, prejudice, an oppressive Roman regime. Um, anything sound familiar so far? You know, just it, it kind of, we're, we're living in these times at the moment. And there was this message of truth um, which needed to be communicated, which involved a radical change to living. And again, we have that. So you had to be, repent and be baptized. The initial leader, the first person on the scene, um, has been already been killed very early on in the gospel, setting the scene for what's coming, really. Jesus has taken on the role. He started mobilizing. He's started doing things like healings, but on the wrong day. Uh, you know, well, not when you're supposed to do it, not in the way that you're expected to do it. He's been teaching people. He's been training people. We saw that he took time for prayer. Um, and to rest and recuperate and all of these things seem to be to me anyway to be mirrored in in the work that we're doing in civil disobedience and in the work at the world that we live in and at the end of last week we discussed three questions we talked about where does our authority come from and do we feel confident in that how do we how do we speak with friends and family because that was a that was an issue for Jesus um or at least maybe it wasn't an issue for him but it was certainly an issue for his friends and his family and when and how do we poke the hornet's nest because he definitely did things which he didn't need to do in the way that he did them for example that time when he healed the man with the withered hand on the sabbath like that man had been ill for a long time he could have waited another day and then nobody would have been upset. But he he specifically tried to poke the hornet's nest. OK, so uh, we're moving on. So. We've already just been saying that Jesus doesn't do things the right way. He doesn't eat the proper food. He doesn't wash in the right way. He heals on the wrong day. He heals two people who aren't Jews. And none of these things were seen as right or conventional or expected. And we see this ourselves, you know, we don't do things the way the friends of the earth do it. We don't do things the way the wildlife trust do it. We're not saying those, th those ways are wrong. We just, we just don't con conform. So how does Jesus respond when he gets this criticism from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? So we're in chapter seven and the, the Pharisees are saying, look, you, you sat down to eat without washing in the proper way. You didn't wash your hands in the proper way. And he redirects the question and he says, you know, this is this is what it's all really about. Sorry, I'm just going to pull out my Bible. He says, you know, you're focusing on totally the wrong thing. Um, you, you shouldn't really be bothered about my hands. You should be bothered about what's really going on here. And in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6, it says, is that in verse 6? Yeah. Um, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are mere human rules. You know, you, you've just got it wrong. You, you've got to, you know, he's... He's saying that they're nitpicking about whether they're tithing and they're not actually thinking about what really matters. So he redirects the question and he points that, points them to what it's all about. And we need to do that, too. We're always being asked about our methods. Uh, we're always being asked about, you know, why are you on a road? Why are you doing it this way? And in fact, we need to, to talk about what really matters and we are experiencing climate breakdown and we have to get the government to act. So the first question, we're not going to stop for these questions, is which traditions do we need to break? Uh, maybe we've broken some already. 
And how do we respond to people who don't like us breaking with convention or tradition? And just to remember that this is the Christian way. The Christian way is to break with tradition, it seems. Okay, so then we're on to counting the cost or being prepared for the worst. So, so far in this gospel, we've seen healing, casting out of demons, compassionate provision of food, demonstration of power when Jesus stopped the storm, and lots of teaching about how the kingdom will grow, about authority and faith, forgiving sins and restoring life. And it must have been quite a ride, you know, um, seeing the healings and the miracles and hearing someone explain how to live a life of love. But at the start of that journey, they knew what might happen. I mean, John the Baptist's arrest and subsequent death showed them, you know, what they were getting into. But maybe they'd forgotten. Maybe they'd got comfortable and they were just enjoying the party. And I think that can happen to us. You know, we we go all out, we get arrested, we do something or we're in line with all of that. And then we get comfortable or we kind of pull back or. Um, or we forget, we forget the cost. So chapters eight and nine of Mark's gospel is like a reminder. And Jesus says, you know, he's going to be rejected, killed and rise again. And the disciples have to face up to that too. So he doesn't hide what's coming, but he wants them to reaffirm their commitment. He's saying, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So he doesn't start with, will you die for this cause? He starts with, this is the good news. This is how life works. This is what's important. And only then, so are you in? So it's tempting, I think, in the work that we do to think that if we make the entry easier for people, we'll draw more people in. If we say you don't need to do anything risky, if, you, if we say you won't need to be arrested, but Jesus doesn't water down the risk or the ask. So once we've decided whether we think something has to be done or not, then it's a question of what can we do to make it happen rather than making the decision based on the risk to our wealth or health or our status. So I think the question we need to ask ourselves when we're thinking about what do I do in this in this action that we, we need to take to see what we can do to give us a chance of a life that is not a, a complete climate collapse and a complete civil collapse. The question we need to ask ourselves is not, can I be arrested? But do I believe this has to be done? So the Question: The question we often ask new people, or maybe we think to ask new people, is can you be arrested? But the question really is, do you believe it has to be done? And then if you think it has to be done, then, then you find out where your place is in that. So there's, there's a difference there. Okay, so we're moving on to faith. So in Mark chapter 9, verses 70 to, 17 to 29, the, the boy, uh, there was the boy who the disciples couldn't heal. And it seems that Jesus was only able to heal because the father had faith and because he prayed. There are lots of ways this could be interpreted. We haven't got time to go into them, but it does seem there's a spiritual battle going on here. And as Christians, we are equipped to take that battle on to have faith when others may not have those same inner resources. And sometimes faith is an essential part of the battle. So I'd like to ask you, and again, we're not stopping for these questions, but when have we been the ones who have had to carry others through with our faith? And when can our faith be bold in the face of the seemingly impossible? I want to think now about um, ego. So we know that the uh, the movement that Jesus started didn't stop um, with his death. He's not only building a movement, he's building a community, but he's also preparing. Jesus was preparing all the while, while to leave a gap at the top when he died and rose. So as in all movements, the role you play doesn't stay static. And this movement is one where it's not a question never a question of climbing the ladder. As we read earlier, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
And in chapter 9, 33 to 37, it, this group of people keep getting the, me- for this group of people to keep getting the message out there, growing the kingdom, ensuring love remains at the heart of everything, there can't be room for ego. Jesus says really clearly, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And in civil resistance, there's a sense in which it's easier to maintain the idea of servanthood and no one being indispensable because at a moment's notice, as we witnessed only uh, last week, people with very significant roles can be arrested and, and even put in prison. And this is what happened going forward. In, if you read Acts and then the letters of Paul, imprisonment was common. It wasn't an unusual thing. You know, we think in Christian climate action that we're a bit unusual because the percentage of people within this group who've been arrested or maybe gone to prison is quite high uh, in terms of, uh, of, of Christians in the UK, certainly. You know, sometimes we take on roles in this movement because we volunteer for them. Sometimes we need to step away from a role because someone else is better suited to it. So in the work that I do, for example, you know, you need a different spokesperson on for for right wing, um, you know, for a right wing audience to the or a local radio show or or if the Guardian wanted to interview somebody, you know, you need somebody different. You can't. We're saying all the time with our spokespeople. Um, You have to let ego go. Let's get the right person for this. And we have to do that right the way through the movement. Um, And so so it's worth thinking about that, I think. You know, where is their ego and Um, self-denial? What is it um, about ego and self-denial that can be applied to civil resistance? And I wonder if you've seen this in action or if you've ever had to challenge it. I wonder if you've ever had to take on something that you felt you weren't up to, but others thought you were. And I also wonder if there's anyone that you kind of secretly think in Christian Climate Action or Extinction Rebellion or in Just Stop Oil, who you feel is indispensable. Because if Jesus wasn't indispensable, then like no one is indispensable. Okay, so now we're moving on to um, whether who, who's who's in who's who can be included in this. Is there room for the rich? So in in chapter ten, uh, verse seventeen to thirty one, we have the rich man who wants to be part of the kingdom. He wants to inherit eternal life, and the question is: Is there room for him in the movement? What does he need to do to join? And Jesus clearly says there is room for him. No one is stopping him. He is stopping himself. So, again, what's the learning there? You know, people who aren't coming in or if we're stopping ourselves maybe from doing things, what's our learning there? I think it's very pertinent as well that it's a rich person. Because it's the inequality in distribution of wealth that's got us here. So practicing redistribution and generosity within a group of civil resistors is key. And in some ways, it's easier. And many people in listening today um, will <laughs> give testament to this. It's easier to become poor when you're doing civil resistance. You can receive fines, you can lose your job, you can lose money because of your own offences or even for sharing because you're sharing the burden of others. So it's not maybe any more a question of giving away wealth or focusing on what's important and it, it and, and losing wealth as a consequence. So, so you need to, to be thinking, what's important? What do I need to do? And then wealth, no wealth. You know, Paul said he was happy with either. Um, it's really what's important in this story for the civil resistance movement. And what are the barriers that are getting in the way? Is it money or is it something else? Is it fear? Who knows? Okay, so now we're on to action. So after the healings and the picnics, um, calming naturally occurring weather events, we're now into the, the lead up to Jesus's death. So in chapter 11, we have the march with banners, that sounds familiar. Well, palm leaves, banners. Um, 
Verse 11, we've got preparing for action the following day. So checking out the entrances and the security and how to get maximum impact. That was popping down to the temple to, to see what to do. Um, chapter 11, verse 12 to 14, we've got killing a fig tree. I mean, some actions are just quirky. <laughs> uh, maybe you understand this one, but it's it's tricky for me to sort this one out. But I think that's how we are with some some actions. I know I'm going to get people saying, oh, well, the reason why they did the fig tree was killed afterwards. But anyway. And then chapter 11, verses 15 to 17, we've got the symbolic action in the temple, overturning the tables of the money chambers, changes and the benches of those selling doves. And then after that, we've got speeches in the temple. So, you know, what's achieved by each of these actions and which is most effective? You know, we don't necessarily know. You know, we know now which ones we remember, which ones speak to us, but maybe a different generation, a different people at the time, maybe they were different. So there's the, there's the whole range of marching, preparing, symbolic actions, speeches, all of that. Sometimes you need to make a big splash. Sometimes you're targeting specific pe people. And clearly you hear we've got another very strong poke at the hornet's nest. So this was discussed a little bit in the groups last week. How do we recognize or plan the right actions to either organize or join? Then we've got Jesus handling questions. So in 11, chapter 11, 21 to 12, verse 40, Jesus has to handle a lot of questions, a lot of stupid questions, clever people trying to trap him. And he responds with clever riddles and with stories and often quite obliquely. Finally, he gets a sensible answer, which is, which is the greatest commandment? And he gives a really straightforward answer. So the question I have for you is what line should we take when we're questioned, especially when people are trying to trap us or trying to show us that they're right? Do we tell them what they need to hear rather than answering their question? Do we ask them why they're asking the question? You know, if they're asking about our methods, why aren't they talking about the catastrophe? So when we're questioned over minutiae or irrelevancies, we need to do what Jesus did. Jesus pivoted the conversation to what mattered. And we need to be clear about what that is and how to direct the conversation towards it. So I know it's really annoying when you're listening to a, a, a politician being asked questions and they seem to never answer them. But it seems to me that Jesus sometimes didn't answer the question either. He just, that's such a stupid question. I'm not answering it. I'm certainly not answering it directly. So the question is, is it okay for a Christian to avoid answering the question and just say what needs to be said? And do you ever do it? Okay, we're on to counting the cost and preparing for the worst. We've got so used to the gospel that we no longer realize how radical it is to talk about practicing forgiveness and love or insisting on justice and peace. And at the moment, we are seeing in Gaza and in Israel a real lack of forgiveness and love and justice and peace. So, to, when we hear that, when we hear that at the moment, we realize how it cuts through, we realize how radical it is. Uh, and yet sometimes I think we've forgotten, we've forgotten that we have that, and that's that's our nonviolent weapon. Forgiveness, love, justice, peace. This gospel of forgiveness and love, of justice and peace was what landed people in prison, what cost some people their lives. To us, it seems absolutely obvious that we have to love each other. That just is a given, it seems so obvious. And in the same way in civil resistance, we're asking for things which seem just so obvious. 
equality for people of all backgrounds, a stop to manufacturing, keeping, using nuclear weapons, no new drilling for oil and gas, no mining for coal, protection of woods and oceans. All of these things just seem so obvious. But for the powers that be, these are preposterous and impossible and unimaginable things to ask. For just as the children being of great value was in Jesus' time, he said they were valuable. And clearly, that was not what everyone thought. So we need to be clear that we're doing what we do for everyone, and it's and it is generally the, the least we can ask for. But the consequences of asking for what makes rational sense are hard to face up to. So Jesus said, when you are in court, so it's not a question of if, but when. Chapter 13, verse 9, he says, you will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. In verse 11, he says, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial. So this gospel that we have, that we adhere to, that we go to church to, to, the, to, to worship with others for, arrest was going to be normal for people who took the gospel seriously. And I do wonder when Christians stopped thinking that arrest and flogging and punishments was, was part of being a Christian. So if you know that being arrested and brought to trial, if you knew that it being arrested and brought to trial was a question of not if, but when, would you continue with what you're doing right now? You know, whether that's designing actions or gluing to roads or police station support or vigils or even being part of Christian climate action. If you knew that that could mean you were arrested and brought to trial, what would you do? OK, moving on to um, signs of the end, end of the age, staying awake and facing the truth. So in chapter 13, the really strong message of, of chapter 13 is that it's about what is to come and it's about keeping your eyes open and staying awake. Now, people have often thought that we were in the end times. And I guess if you look at the whole of the history of the world, we, we've always been in the end times. Um, and science is telling us that we are seeing the end of the sta stable world as we know it. Well, we're seeing that. We're certainly seeing it. We are seeing our seasons and weather patterns being disrupted. We can't long. We can no longer rely on heat, cold, rain, sun at the right times for us to grow crops reliably, and for all the many species of plants and animals to to survive. So facing up to the climate and ecological disaster feels very much like chapter thirteen, and many many people are opting to keep their eyes shut and sleepwalk into this disaster. Some people know it's happening, but are ignoring it. Some are just hoping it will go away. Jesus says quite clearly, that's not supposed to be us. We're supposed to be staying awake. You know, that this that's not an option for Christians. We have to be informed. We have to be up to date on what's been discovered on climate related disasters and other changes and to live as if it's true. So the question then is, what does staying awake at this time mean for you and for others in civil resistance? A little bit more on betrayal and trials. So there is a clear blueprint that we can follow into action. So. I've not put the references in, but you can read this in Mark. So discernment is the first thing. And this happened all through Jesus's life, but maybe particularly when he took time alone to think and pray. You know, we may be up for action, but we also need to think things through and try to take the right action at the right time. So that's number one, discernment. The next one is heading into action. So and knowing what that will mean, or what you think it might mean, Jesus went to Jerusalem. He wasn't arrested in Galilee. 
So it's not a question of being passive. Sometimes we need to head out into action or into danger. So discernment, heading into action, betrayal. Judas was a trusted member of the team. You know, sometimes information that we have will come into the hands of the press or the police from someone we thought we could trust. We need to be ready for that. And Jesus didn't lose his love for Judas. You know, he was he was ready for that. He understood. Gethsemane. So this is that moment before it all happens when you could turn around and decide you're not going to do it, you know. So Jesus, there was prayer, there was consideration, there was looking for an alternative option. You know, having cold feet is understandable. And maybe sometimes it will be right not to go ahead with something. And Jesus had that moment. You know, he's not un unlike us at all. <laughs> On this occasion, though, Jesus went ahead. So we've had discernment, heading into action, being betrayed, Gethsemane, that, that cold feet moment, trials. Okay, number one, don't expect a fair one. Sometimes it's right to speak up. Sometimes it's right to stay silent. Maybe sometimes it's right to plead guilty. Sometimes it's right to not to plead not guilty. You don't get much less fair than Jesus's trial. And know that you're going alone. So we go into action with others, but essentially, at the end of the day, we are on our own. You can't always rely on your court support, especially if their name is Peter. You know, being part of a group or a campaign or a movement is great, and we are, but there always comes a time when you're on your own, whether that's in a police cell or in court or on top of a structure blocking an entrance or, or at home trying to work on some some difficult spreadsheet that's that's organizing the police station support whatever it is there'll be a time when you're on your own so trials and punishment of part are part of what we're committed to if we're going to follow christ they are not optional extras but really possible outcomes and we know that you know I know that people who are going into action who are saying, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not arrestable, I'm not going to get arrested. They go with a burner phone. They know that they might get arrested. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of sometimes, you know, we know that we're, we're risking things. Okay. So keep putting the message out there. As we reach the end of the gospel, we see the disciples, their leader has gone, they had nothing but each other and what they'd learned from listening to and being with Jesus. And that's what they built on in all their imperfection. And that's why we know about it today. So frightening and surprising though it may be, this you, I, all of us here, have been called to step up to this. We, like those early disciples, are equipped with the Holy Spirit and we have this great manual of how to keep living the truth, truth even though it's a really risky business. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording shortly, but I'm just going to, for the sake of the recording and for um, maybe what you might want to do if you've just listened to this at home, um, I'm going to suggest that we go into three groups and that we have an, you have an option of which group you want to go to. So one group we will be thinking about arrest and prison. So if it's a case of not if, but when you get arrested for whatever you're doing, whether that's writing a newsletter, taking part in a vigil, just being part of CCA, will you go on? Uh, another group I thought could be rich and poor. So how does the story of the rich man influence your thinking about the civil disobedience movement? And then the third group to be stay awake, staying awake. What does it mean at this time? 
how much truth do we need to look at? And then what do we need to do with it? 